Well, somebody had to follow the astronaut, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I get to follow it up with media bias. This is also just a perspective thing. I was watching it uh, back in the, in the speaker room, and we have these miniaturized columns here. So for those folks that are watching things remotely, the speakers are not like 200 feet tall um, uh, walking <laughs> past them. It kind of reminds me of the Stonehenge scene in um, um, uh, uh, Spinal Tap, uh, exactly. Cool, so thanks for being here. So we're gonna talk about media bias now. Um, this is just a shot again for people who are watching remotely, at least I can start mine in space, but we're gonna end up down here at the Reynolds Journalism Institute. RJI uh, is uh, part of the journalism school here at the University of Missouri, uh, the first, and a lot of people believe the finest school of journalism in the world. I'm a startup guy, and so I believe that one of the ways that you solve problems is through taking on a lot of risk uh, uh, and innovating, but one of the reasons that I want to point to this is because I believe that most of the really great innovations and the R&D that's coming out, at least in this country, are coming from universities, and we'll talk about more of that later. One thing you might want to do during lunch um, is, this is the Reynolds Journalism Institute here, um, just write down the sidewalk um, is a monument to uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it's the monument that was the first uh, grave marker, I guess, for, for his tomb. And you can see the little statue here. And try not to feed the students um, uh, while you're out there. Um, but there it is right there. So it's just less than a minute walk um, uh, from the J School. There's another shot. But the reason I thought it was important, Jefferson was an idealist. But basically, there was a quote uh, that is at least attributed to him where if it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers and newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment uh, to prefer the latter. Um, and that's, uh, uh, it's an idealistic quote. Of course, it's also uh, uh, a couple of, well, at least a hundred year old uh, quote. So, you know, now it would probably insert iPads uh, or something along those lines. But, but it's interesting. And it, what it really speaks to is it speaks to the really, really important part of a free press and the role that they serve in democracy. Um, that's another kind of key theme to, to pay attention to. You know, some folks uh, will come and address uh, journalism school uh, students and they'll say, hey, change your major. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, I think the demand uh, has done nothing but increase uh, for news. People spend a lot more time with it. The main things that have changed are the business models and the distribution systems. Uh, in a nutshell, that means not waiting until 10 p.m. for a newscast to come on television or five o'clock in the morning uh, for your newspaper to arrive in your driveway. Uh, technology obviously has played a big part um, uh, in, in the shift and the change of, of news and information distribution uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on WordPress. Um, it was an interesting quote I saw this last week, but publishing's no longer an industry, uh, it's a button. Um, and the newspaper industry in some ways was at one time classified uh, as a manufacturing um, plant. And then, Probably one of the most important things that's happened is this, there's just been an explosion of credible news sources, incredible news sources on like a global basis. So how many people here have ever read Barry Ritholtz's blog, a big, The Big Picture? Has anybody ever read that in here? A couple, maybe, just me? Uh, anyhow, uh, the point being, um, uh, Barry blogged a lot about the global financial crisis uh, and is now an important, credible uh, news source. Um, even the press, when they report on themselves, find a way uh, to make themselves look good, even when they look bad. Um, so uh, you can take a look uh, at what these charts point to. Um, you're seeing doubling uh, over the last 15, 20, 25 years of how people believe that stories are biased, of, of how people believe that uh, the news organizations are greatly influenced um, uh, by powerful people. And, um, in fact, the only group I could find um, that they even came close to uh, was Congress. Um, so we don't even call it an approval rating anymore. We call it a disapproval um, uh, rating. Um, here are four of the five uh, kind of important components about um, media bias. So when I was going to journalism school here, we spent a tremendous amount of time staying up way too late, drinking way too much beer, and talking about objectivity. Um, uh, I don't really believe that objectivity uh, as possible. I think that you can't get outside of yourself 
uh, and a lot of people have gone crazy trying to do so. Um, uh, then there's the unintentional uh, component uh, of media bias. One of the other trends that's changed significantly since I was in school here is I believe that corporations and governments have become far more effective at telling their version of a story than newspapers or, or journalists have been able to report on that story. Um, so the unintentional component is being led down uh, a certain path. Of course, there's the intentional component. You know, one of the examples that people use here in the United States is maybe the MSNBC on one side and Fox on the other, uh, where there is a lot more uh, uh, opinion journalism uh, in, uh, uh, in what's going on. And then I also put the other one as human. This is kind of more of a reader uh, component. You'll see in the next slide, you have access to thousands and thousands of sources. Uh, the question is, is do you as a reader just keep going back to the same sources that you would go back to? For example, if you happen to be uh, a New York Times reader, uh, and you go to Google News and you type in something, and the New York Times is one of 5,000 sources there. Do you just go to the New York Times, or are you branching out and trying to explore yourself and, and your own consumption? And then finally, algorithmic. Um, the reality is, is that, as we talked about the change in distribution systems where um, nobody's <laughs> waiting for a newscast or waiting for a newspaper, news organizations have learned through search engine optimization and through a variety of different ways to be able to increase the visibility of their results um, uh, in search results, so that's another uh, important part. This is an interesting slide. I just pulled this the other day right after the Zimmerman uh, arrest broke, but you can see what I was mentioning before. There are 5,347 sources um, uh, on the Trayvon case, um, and this really gets into what sources do you choose um, and how far do you look uh, outside of the box. This was uh, uh, an interesting piece that came up in Think Progress. This just talks about the mentions of the Trayvon case um, uh, over, I think it's about one week uh, a period of time. You can see uh, some of the differences uh, in reporting there. Again, just quantitative. Um, another uh, component of, of Trayvon here, again, is the intentional uh, or the unintentional uh, component. And this is NBC coming out and saying that there was a audio clip from the police call that had been edited to have the appearance uh, that the, um, uh, the unfortunate uh, uh, shooting uh, was, was racially um, uh, motivated. Uh, they ended up letting that producer go. Um, and then this, of course, is some of the internal uh, components. So uh, MSNBC uh, is reporting on this story, um, uh, but also the Reverend Al Sharpton uh, also works uh, for MSNBC. Uh, and Sharpton has become a central uh, part uh, of the story. So I just tried to grab uh, a recent example of, uh, of a, an important story. So how do we battle media bias? Um, we, I think the first place that we start is what I call multi-source journalism. Uh, and multi-source journalism is, is the idea of going out and pulling a number of sources together for you so that you can actually see the differences in reporting. You know, one, one thing that we might ask someone to do is try to themselves go out there and do the work but the reality is, is that it's a lot easier and it's a lot more convenient if someone does that work for you. Um, human uh, editorial curation. I spent a lot of time in the search business. Um, uh, I think artificial intelligence is a really cool concept. Uh, the reality is, is that an algorithm can tell you that this is a story about um, uh, Obama's uh, uh, campaign. The reality is, is that it also cannot tell you the differences uh, in that reporting. So you still need the human hand uh, involved in that. So journalism school students, your careers are still uh, uh, alive. Um, teen storytelling. This was a breakdown uh, at NBC uh, on the Today Show with the Trayvon case. You've got to have this story touch multiple hands, and it's very important for there to be multiple brains on it so that it's not being driven primarily by one uh, ideology. Links and attribution. Uh, links um, uh, are very much part of the ecosystem uh, on the internet uh, and on mobile devices, and you need to give really significant attribution, and you need to provide multiple links wherever possible. And then finally, the, the fifth component is what I call discovery and sampling. Look, I think sampling sells. There's a reason when you're walking through the grocery store and there's a person standing there with a little piece of sausage on a toothpick that wants you to sample it, because uh, the likelihood of you buying it goes up considerably. So um, I think sampling really sells. I think that that's how you really reach out to people 
and not only expose them uh, to a different perspective on the story, but start to expose them to um, different sources, alternative sources, sources that you would not normally go to yourself. Um, because one of the reasons that I think that this is so important is, is I believe that we've become so polarized, um, not only within this country, um, but, but frequently around the world, that we are starting to lose our capacity to be able to listen to each other. And when you can't listen to each other, you can't really have a conversation. And when you can't have a conversation, you can't really solve problems. And that's where the importance of news and multi-source news uh, comes in. Um, just a couple of other quick little points. Sometimes people say, um, hey Spencer, uh, don't the MSNBC folks just really want to hear what MSNBC does, or the New York Times folks, or, or the Fox News folks? And you can see by these numbers, yes, there is a certain percentage of the population that wants to be told what they already believe. Um, now, we've got to work on them, and that's where I think some of this multi-source journalism comes in. But you can see uh, on the lower chart, the vast majority of people, especially when they're in an online environment, want to have um, a news brought to them without a, a political point of view. Um, this next chart was uh, another Pew chart um, that, uh, that I used actually as part of a, a project that I'm working on. But you can see links to related material is the number one thing that they ask for. And the third thing is being a portal site uh, or news aggregator. They're looking for multiple points of view. The, the fourth one uh, is being able to share content with others so that they can turn around and republish it out to other people and share those ideas. I mean, ultimately, it's about making you the most interesting person at the cocktail party so that when someone comes in and says, you know, essentially repeats the headlines, that you're like, you know, that was really interesting, but I read this newspaper in China, and they had a very, very different take on the global financial <laughs> crisis. Um, so uh, that's part of that. Uh, this is just a very quick demo uh, of a project that I'm involved with. It's partnered with a journalism school. Um, uh, it, it, uh, these are some of the apps uh, that actually kind of deliver uh, on some of the value propositions uh, uh, that we're presenting uh, in here. And then, what do we owe? We go back to space again. Uh, and um, we we're coming back down on, on Reynolds Journalism Institute. And uh, Travis um, uh, and Mike, if you guys want to, there's, there's a couple of points that I want to make about risk and innovation. That was the first thing that we spoke about. And you probably recognize uh, two or three uh, of the four people up here in these photos. There's the founders of Yahoo on the left, left, right, uh, and uh, the founders of Google uh, right next to them. And these are two of the most important companies when it comes to news and information in the last 10 or 15 years. Both of these companies were founded by two people meeting each other uh, at Stanford University's computer science department, which is an excellent, excellent program. I would posit that you're in the finest school of journalism in the world right here, and that um, that your next best business partner uh, could be sitting right next to you uh, or in this room. And that as you look across the room or as you go to this lunch and you go try to talk to people and meet people, that you have those kind of concepts in mind because that's how people innovate. That's how they win. And I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you so much. <laughs>